Good morning, everybody. It's a great blessing to be with you and to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. Today, we are continuing to teach along the lines of the power of God, bringing forth the life of God in our lives as we are just studying from Ephesians chapter 1. The vision that I have with us as a congregation, be it a local congregation or online congregation, is that each one of you will be established in the gospel, that you will know the gospel, that your life will be born from this gospel, that you might experience the power of God's life in your life today. That is what God has envisioned for us. God has created the earth and he has made man to dwell in the earth. That is what the scripture says in Acts 17. And he has then made this earth to reveal himself so that we can see and feel and touch him in the hope that we would love what we see because he is now producing everything that he is and what is in heaven is bringing that forth in earth as our eternal place of habitation where we will be forever. You remember for Man, from that you were a child as a Christian, we believe that uh, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and therein will dwell the glory of God. When it talks about a new heaven and a new earth, it simply talks about earth being renewed, made new, not being under the rule of death anymore, but being under the rule of life. It doesn't say another earth. It says just that what we have will be made new. We can think of a car that goes and the car is now having an engine problem and then they overhaul the engine and respray the car, then you will say, I've got a new car. It's the same car. It's just now being made new. And that is what God has come to do for us. That is what he's come to give us in this earth. And I think as our mind gets, uh, uh, as, and as we wrap our mind around this truth, we will find purpose and we'll find strength to live in this world, and we will start to experience the power and love of God right here, right now. That is what it's about. Unfortunately, there's been so many doctrines and teachings, which is all about man trying to live up to a st certain standard to one day uh, qualify to go to heaven and not hell, instead of seeing God lovingly reaching out to man that is in this world where there is decay and destruction and is offering us life right here, right now, and that it has begun in the resurrection of Jesus and that it will continue and never end until the consummation of everything, until the full manifestation of everything, which is the fullness of God manifesting in the flesh, in this earth, as what it is in Jesus. We need to understand as the church, and I think it's very important for us to know this, and that is that we as humans are important to God, spirit, soul, and body, and that he is not just throwing away the body and seeing it as basically an hindrance. He sees the physical body, who we are as physical people, as the place where what is not seen becomes seen and experienced. It even says that the unseen God, there's an unseen God. And if we don't see God, how will people see God outside of the love of God that is towards us shaping our lives into lives wherein we see love manifest in us? Now, as an introduction, I want to say this. Because of being bombarded with teachings of condemnation and guilt, where it has always been said, you know, you need to live up to this, to certain standards. You need to be serious with God. You need, and then, oh man, you know, there are so many messages the person can go and look at where it's focused on your efforts and your strength and how you need to live right and how you need to be holy and all those kind of things. Otherwise, you're going to burn in hell and you're not going to go to heaven. Because of all of that, uh, there's a renounce in our hearts against any form of fruit 
where we talk about fruit or the effect of the gospel in our lives. It's almost as if when we hear about loving your neighbor or we hear about being generous or we hear about kindness or we hear anything about being delivered from uh, certain attributes that we would have in our personality, like, for instance, um, anger or being irritated quickly or uh, always hating or gossiping or whatever that might be. We don't want to hear of that because that has always been seen as a disqualification. And the reason why it's been seen as a disqualification was it was presented as the way you have to be in order to go to heaven, which is basically not a biblical doctrine. You know, I've I've posted this on Facebook several times, and I've just asked, and it is radical. It might be radical to you listening to me now, and I would like for you to bear with me when I make this statement, but find me one scripture in the New Testament where there's an invitation to go to heaven by any of the apostles if you believe in Jesus. Just find me one verse. I'm not asking for three or a, a, a whole chapter even explaining it or even that amount of text. I just need one verse where Paul said, who of you want to go to heaven, believe in Jesus, or where Jesus said that, or where Peter said that as an invitation uh, on what you need to do. It, it is, there is literally not one verse in all of the New Testament that states that. What the New Testament is full of is that God by his love and his power, can save us from the death that has entered into this world through the disobedience of Adam and where he can set us free from the bondage that we were under on account of the spirit of the air, uh, which we would basically think of as what the devil did in Adam, where we can be a people that are free and that we don't have to be at the mercy of what happens in politics or at the mercy of what happened in how I was raised by my parents or in what has happened to me yesterday or the day before, but where my life right now can find its birth from the power of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. An invitation unto being set free from that which destroys your life is everywhere in the New Testament. That we find. And what we basically are seeing is that the gospel is not just about what will happen in the sweet by and by, but it's about God coming to love his people unto true freedom. That is what it is all about. And once we put those lenses on and we start to see through those lenses and we read Ephesians, we read Galatians, we read Philemon, we read what, what we see in the New Testament, it is as if, and that's what my experience is, is as if my almost the fibers of my being becomes receptors for the love of God towards me and then for the purpose of that love, which is for me to share in his life. It's it's then uh, my senses, my mind, my understanding, uh, what I plan for the next day is shaped into uh, expectation of God not me by my works, but God bringing forth his life in me, in loving on people, in having the things of this world, my house, my family, who I am as a person, as the place where I find the life of God manifest by him, where I'm not just waiting for something one day, but where right now, we can start to experience the life of God. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. If you go and listen to our previous Sundays and everything that we've ministered uh, is uh, along the lines of Ephesians chapter 1, we find a beautiful gospel where this gospel is a gospel where we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing that is in heavenly places, where Paul basically states that we've been adopted as the children of God, where he states that God had a dream for us from before the world began, and that would be that he makes a world a place wherein he can come and become visible in Jesus and wherein he shares his life with us where who we are 
uh, will also then be a manifestation of who the Father is, that God can be all in all in this earth. Imagine we believe this with all of our heart. Wouldn't that change how a husband treats his wife? Not from the power of the husband now showing commitment because of an obligation, but from the power of a new birth, from the power of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. Would this not change uh, the respect that a wife has for a husband as we find this truth manifesting in both? Isn't this a place where we will find healthy marriage, absolute healthy marriage? Imagine a husband and a wife together believing and understanding what I've just shared in the few minutes in the introduction of this message and grabbing a hold of that with all of their heart where they say we are the recipients of this and we acknowledge the truth of this as the absolute truth of what God is bringing forth in the earth. It will change your marriage. It will impact the way you raise your children. It will impact the way you think of this world. And it will bring a peace and a rest to you that could never be attained by the wisdom of this world. It would be what Paul would call the manifestation of the rule of Christ in this earth. That is what it will be. So when I preach this and when I share this, I want to say I I basically stand in the shoes of Jesus, in the shoes of the Apostle Paul, wherein there is uh, a seriousness inside me in sharing this with you which was carried by the Apostle Paul in spreading this truth as the source or the the fountain of power from where we experience the life of God, not as an obligation where we feel guilty, but as access to the life of God in this world. This is what it is all about. Imagine your life is so secure in what God has done, in acknowledgement of what Jesus Christ has done, that you don't see the need to try and uh, cure yourself by your own power or where you are trying to use another, your husband or your wife or your child or whatever, to heal you by acting right every day because you are healed by what you see in Jesus. Imagine that. The world can be a different place. Your life can be a different place. Right. The way you live will change. I want to read from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15. And in this introduction, I'm saying this. When we talk about fruit, when we talk about the manifestation of God's life in us now, don't ever see it as a negative thing. Never see it as a point of uh, disqualification when you don't see that life. And I think that's important thing to say in, in the introduction here. When you don't see fruit in your life, don't let it be uh, a point of disqualification. If you don't see fruit in your life, let it be something that you say, I can now take to the throne of grace, wherein God will grace me with his life protecting, life-preserving power, wherein I will be set free from that because even that area of my life is where God has promised freedom for me in Jesus. And that is how we can live. So when you see any form of a disqualification or any form where you see there's not fruit, don't say, oh my goodness, I'm not good enough before God because I haven't changed here. What's wrong with me? No, you just go and um, like what a a student goes to a university or you go for some education somewhere, if you don't understand something, what do you do? Do you now say, well, there's something wrong with me? No, you go to the teacher or you go to the professor or you go to the textbook and you study and you learn until you understand. And that is how we think about this. We are students of the very life of God where God teaches us And his way of teaching is not just mental understanding, but he teaches us with his life, bringing forth his life in us. Isn't it beautiful to be in the presence of a Lord, Jesus Christ, of God himself, which says, let me teach you my life. And if you don't get it right, put it in my hands, let me teach you my life. 
It's beautiful. That is what he's, he's come to give us. Right, I'm reading from first uh, from Ephesians 1.15. He says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not stop to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And remember that we shared about this last week, and this is a game changer for understanding Ephesians and Galatians and so forth. And that spirit of wisdom and understanding, I've shared that it is not so much just a supernatural spirit, but that Paul has in mind here that clear teaching would come to them. And that clear teaching would obviously be accompanied by a teacher. So, and we've referenced the first John chapter four, where it says, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits. The spirit that acknowledges that Jesus was raised from the dead is of God. He that does not acknowledge the physicality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not of God. So what he's saying here is, he says, I pray that you may have a spirit of wisdom and understanding in the knowledge of him. That simply means that I pray that you may have accurate teaching on what the gospel truly means and what it means for you today. And that people will come your way that will teach you that. And I'm sure that the Apostle Paul had himself in mind as what he would in other letters pray and say that, uh, pray that a door might be opened unto me that I might come unto you. Where Paul prayed and said, I pray that I might come unto you would be equivalent to saying or praying that a spirit of wisdom and revelation might be given unto them. That someone would come to them and teach them the gospel, show them what the gospel truly means. And what this teacher then would do and what the true gospel, uh, the, this true teaching or the enlightenment of the understanding would mean, or as what we read here, that a spirit of wisdom and revelation might be given unto them. What Paul means by that is that the eyes of their understanding might be enlightened, that they might start to understand the gospel. That is what it is all about, to understand the gospel. And I think that is one of the greatest prayers that you can pray for yourself and for your husband, wife, or for your children. And when I talk about a prayer, I'm not talking about a about silent wishing. I'm talking about praying, communicating with God. And that is that you might understand, that you might have eyes uh, wherein the, that, the lens through which you look might be enlightened. And pray that for your wife, pray that for your children, pray that for your friends, where you say, Lord, I come and I thank you that you, that I receive and I welcome understanding for the gospel. And thank you that you bring across my path someone that might understand this gospel and share it with me. Or even as I read the scriptures, thank you that you come and show me what you've meant through the the spirit of truth that was in the apostle Paul or Peter or in Jesus that was where all these teachings was documented in the text. I want to understand. I want enlightened mind of my understanding. And also, and this is how I pray, I say, Lord, thank you that you also empower me, that I can be a spirit of understanding or a teacher to my wife and my children, wherein they can understand how loved they are in Jesus. Imagine men uh, in families saying, Lord, thank you that I can come and stand in front of you saying, my heart is available to understand what it means that Jesus was raised from the dead, to understand, as we will look at a little bit later in our message here, what it means for the power of the resurrection to bring forth a brand new life in me. Thank you that I can have that understanding. And then, as the head of this family, to be a husband that cares for the well-being for the spiritual well-being of my children and of my wife, that they can understand the goodness that you have, where I can be a spirit of understanding unto them, a teacher that 
teach us what it means to have Jesus raised from the dead uh, and what that means to us as a family, where it makes sense, where we can apply it to everyday life. This is what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about taking what Christ has done and applying it to everyday life, seeing the reality of that. You need to understand that Paul's idea of salvation was 100% uh, uh, a unification of the life of God with physical people. That is how he saw salvation. He says, and this is what he prays. He says, I pray, in other words, to have a spirit of wisdom and understanding is when your eyes, according to verse 18, is enlightened, that and enlightened means that you can now see through the light of the life that is in Jesus Christ. When Paul talks about light or illumination, he's having Psalm, I think it's 36 in mind, where it says that uh, in your, with you is the fountain of youth, in your light we see the light. What Paul would understand under that is that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead and he's now got the light of life or the illumination of life, which would mean that he had Jesus had a mortal body that died, but now his body was illuminated with eternal life. And now we can be enlightened. Enlightened would mean to understand that Jesus was raised from the dead and from there interpret life. It goes on. It says uh, that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you might see everything through the knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus and what that means. Now he explains what it is, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. So Jesus had a calling. What was his calling? It was that we can share in the very same life. And now that Jesus has also called us, what he's called us unto is to be sharers of that life to the point that that life shines in us, that we may know the riches of the glory of his power or rulership, the, the inheritance that he has inside us. That is what he says in Ephesians. So he says, listen, this is how it works. I heard that you love the Lord and that you love the church. But now my prayer is, even if you already have fruit in your lives, I pray that someone will come to you, even if it is me, to come and explain to you even deeper what it means to to be part of the church and what the resurrection means for us in the church so that our whole life can be illuminated with that understanding that we can know who we truly are, that we can know, as what he says in Ephesians 1 verse 19, uh, what the exceeding greatness of the power is that raised Christ from the dead that works in us today. That's what he says in verse 20, that we might uh, know the power of the resurrection that works in us, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him uh, at his own right hand. So what that means is this. When Paul talks about resurrection, what he understands is new creation. So to Paul, there's two creations. The creation that was in Adam, and then that creation, in that creation, there was what was called the spirit of the air, the prince of the power of the air, which would be called the devil, or what we would call the Satan that came to Adam, deceived them, and then uh, the power of the fear of death was in the hands of the devil, and the world was controlled by the fear of death. That is what Paul sees. I don't have time to go into all the texts. I don't want to just to make a Sunday service a Bible study. But when we look at what Paul is talking about, there was that creation, that creation where there was a ruler of the world that is under destruction and death. Then Jesus Christ came. And 
in him, he conquered that power and he now became the ruler of the earth and as what through the disobedience of Adam the world was under the rule of death so now when Jesus was raised from the dead the rulership of life has now come to the earth to explain what was in the mind of Paul when Jesus was raised from the dead would be the as follows We've said it so many times. What if Adam didn't disobey God? What would the world be like? Well, we need to understand that there was the Garden of Eden and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then God spoke and brought order. And then he brought a garden there. And the idea was that what was taking place in that garden through Adam would now infiltrate the whole of the cosmos. We get the idea of a multiplication. We get the idea of an expanse of the garden. Uh, because you remember when he sinned, he was put out of the garden. So there was a garden, and then there was a place which was outside of the garden. So the idea was that there would be a rulership, and what was in the garden would expand to the rest of the cosmos. Now, we find the very same thing. God has planted a garden. This garden is what he has done in Jesus, and Jesus then, after his resurrection, and in his the job description that he would would have is, just as with Adam, Jesus, you now don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't sin, eat of the tree of life so that you can live forever and never die so that the, the life that you have can now infiltrate the whole of the cosmos and take over in the earth. So when we think of what if Adam didn't sin and the joy we would ascribe in thinking if he wouldn't sin is what we can now say Adam didn't sin because Jesus is our Adam we had a first Adam and then the last Adam which is our Adam he didn't sin he when he was tempted as was Adam and Eve were tempted he didn't sin he he believed he was sinless he was raised from the dead and now the rule of life has entered the earth the bible says through the disobedience of one man death entered into this world but now through the obedience of one life has entered where this world and we who now believe upon him as what the disobedience of Adam had consequences in the earth. So now we who believe in the Christ, his resurrection has consequences in this earth. And the consequences that it has is it has now it and it sets us free from the rule of of sin and death in this earth and it sets our bodies and our minds free from the rule of the satan in our lives where we are now under the rule of the life of god through jesus christ where as in adam sin and death and bondage and the fruit of the flesh was shaped and formed in our lives so now by the rule of jesus in our lives we find the shaping of what is called the fruit of the spirit in our lives where we find love for even our enemies we find peace we find patience we find long suffering and we find what the scripture mentions in um in Ephesians chapter 4, grace manifests in our lives. Where grace is mentioned as the life-preserving power of God, but grace is also mentioned as the gift that God has given you, the enablement that God has given you through which the rest of the body of Christ is being encouraged and built up as a powerful dwelling of the presence of God in this earth. That is what Paul had in mind when he was preaching. So when he says in verse 19 that they might understand what the exceeding greatness of his power is to us words who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, Verse 21, far above principality and might and dominion and every name that is named, he has in mind freedom from the dominion of 
having a life born from what's happening in the world or born from the evil, wicked powers that is in the world or basically not having that we will not have a life anymore that is born from the bondage that came into this earth through the disobedience of Adam. Let us go to Romans 6, and I'm going to read from verse 6 to 14 to explain that. What I enjoy about the gospel is that it is practical. It's something that is for the here and now. It doesn't leave, leave us as beggars where we just hope for the life of God. We hope for bodily immortality. But we are not hoping for uh, having the first fruit of the Spirit. That hope we've already received, that we live by, in knowing what resurrection means. Resurrection to Paul meant a life that's raised up out from the death that came through the disobedience of Adam right here, right now. Hallelujah. That means, practically, if you look at your wife, your husband, your children, uh, your work situation and all those kind of things, we today can know that as what Christ was raised from out of the death, that grave, we now by the Spirit can already experience the first effect of a life that's raised up out of the death that is in this world. And even while we are still having mortal bodies, uh, that is now from Romans 8 there, even if we have mortal bodies now, even while having mortal bodies, in the hope of an immortal body, we are not excluded from having the first effect of the rulership of Christ in our lives today, where our lives is not born from the threats of this world, where you can look at the politics and you can say, it doesn't matter what they say, I have a life that's born from the Christ. If you've got threats that says you're, gonna, you're going to run out of money, or what if you get the sickness, what, what about this, what about that? The, the, the threats that say you need to grab life from others, abuse them, use them so that you can have some life, that that is not part of your life, where you are at a place where even if you lack in the physical in this world, that you have such a knowledge of the abundance of life as seen in Jesus, that the grace that's in Jesus is in you where you can even uh, go to your neighbor or your friend or your daughter or someone you know and be generous towards that person, love and care for that person because you are set free from the death that's in this world. That is what he's talking about. That is the grace of God. That is the kingdom of God coming into this earth. You know, so many times, I'll get to reading uh, Romans 6 now, but so many times in this world, we think that God's whole issue is, do we do the right thing or do we do the wrong thing? It's all about right and wrong, guilty or not guilty. No, God's idea is to share his life with you. And sharing his life with you would be equivalent to somebody that is a very good fisherman. And he wants to share his life with his children or with someone else. What will he do? He'll make it possible for the other person to know what it feels like to fish. If our God is a God that shares his life with others on account of the abundance of life he possesses, and he wants to share his life with others. He wants to make himself known. He wants others to feel what it feels like to be like him. What would it be else than loving people to the point that they know what it feels like to share their lives with others? That is what it's about. That's, that is where we experience life. Amen. Right. What brought people into fear was a lack of life. They were at a place where they realized their nakedness, like Adam. Oh my goodness, I'm just a mortal man. I only live so long. I don't have eternal life. I must now, I cannot be at a place where I share in God's generous life, which is a life wherein I can 
help others to have life. No, I'm at a place where I need life. So all of a sudden, everything is twisted around. The only solution to that problem is if God would come and show to people that he can solve their death problem and give them life. If they can believe that, then you'll find fruit born from life. Listen to the bondage that Paul mentions in uh, Romans 6 from verse 14. Remember, Jesus' name is above every name that is to be named. And that, and what I'm saying in and picking it up before I deviated from the point a little bit there, he says, I wanted to know the power of his resurrection, because if you know the power of his resurrection, you will know that he was raised up and that he's above every power and every authority and every dominion that there is. He's above all of that. And now that you are in him, you are under his rulership. What would that mean? That would mean the following. Romans 6, verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know you not to whom you've yielded yourself as a servant to obey. That would simply mean we've yielded ourselves to believe the resurrection of Jesus and what he's come to do for us. His servant you are whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. You were the servants of what happened in Adam. But now you've believed the gospel of grace, and now you are free from that bondage, and you are now servants of righteousness, meaning you are now enslaved unto the place where the righteous actions of who the Christ is is now manifesting and shaping your life. That is what he is saying. Over there. So when we think of Jesus being above all powers, all authorities, and whenever we say the, there's no name higher than the name of Jesus, what Paul would have understood by that is that uh, the greatest powers that there were in the world that would lead my life to destruction, there's a higher authority that leads me to life. And that is Jesus. So when I say his name is above any other name, what Paul was saying is nothing can take away the life that God has for me in Jesus because that is what I've come to believe because he is far above all powers and principalities or any name that is to be named, that is named now or that will be named. And he has put all things under his feet, it says in verse 22, and he gave Jesus to be the head of over us his church which is his body wherein all things are fulfilled so where does God fulfill everything that he has dreamt for us according to verse 23 it is in us how does God fulfill everything that is dreamt in us by the power of the resurrection of Jesus in us believing and acknowledging that towards ourselves. Philemon 1.6, we've read it in our introduction. When, what it says in Philemon 1.6, it says, I pray, the very same thing as what, what there is in Ephesians, that you acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Because if you can acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus, you will find that as you acknowledge that, it will bring an empowerment inside you. Now that he was writing to Philemon about a slave, Onesimus, that ran away from him. This Onesimus then, when he ran away from Philemon, which was a person that Paul also led to the Lord. So Paul led Philemon to the Lord. He had a slave. This slave ran away. When the slave ran away, he ran to Paul. Then Paul led the slave to the Lord. Now he says to Philemon, he writes him a letter because he wants the slave to go back to Philemon to work for him again, but that he will not receive him as a slave, but as a brother. And he says to him, listen, I want you to acknowledge every good thing that there is in Christ. Because in the acknowledgement of every good thing that you have in Christ, you'll find that there is no more slave, there's no 
male, female, all those kind of things, that would have passed away. Everything has become new. And that would empower Philemon to look at the one who was a slave now as a brother. And you will find the practical implication of the power of the resurrection in how to deal with people. And even Philemon himself will, will, will say that I am a servant, so when I go back, I can go and serve uh, my previous master and I can go and be good to him because in Christ we have become servants solving a very practical problem through the knowledge of the resurrection that there is in Jesus Christ It says, I heard of your love and your faith, which you had towards, towards the Lord Jesus and towards, the, towards other people. But I pray now that the communication of your faith might become effectual. So yes, you believed in the Lord and you love the church. But here now is a place where someone has harmed you. Something that's not good has happened to you. But I want what you've now believed and the love that you have towards the people might go over into action. That's that word there that it might become effectual by acknowledging everything, good thing, which is in you in Christ. So he say, and now he's setting him up here. Paul is setting him up and he's saying, listen, you know, he doesn't know in the beginning of the letter what it's all about. But I, he says, I pray that you will acknowledge every good thing that's in you in Christ, that you might say, I acknowledge I'm the righteousness of God. When he, when he would say, I acknowledge that I'm the righteousness of God, what he's saying is, is I acknowledge that I am the place where God's righteousness in this earth manifests. I am the place where God's good actions is seen in what God can do with a person that was a sinner and he has been made new and how God can even bring forth the very light of life in that person that he's a light even unto others. That is what he's, what he's setting, setting him up to, to acknowledge here. And he says, for we have great joy and consolation in your love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by you, brother. Wherefore, though I might be a little bold in Christ, I, I speak to you and I'm asking you. And then he comes with a whole thing about um, Onesimus and so forth. So what I want to say to you is this, and I'm ending off with this. When you read Ephesians and you see Paul saying, I want you to understand the power of the resurrection. What he's saying is, is I want you to know what you freely received in Jesus, how powerful that is, because as you know that and what that means for everyday life, you'll find the power that raised Christ from the dead raise you out of the effects of death that came into your life through the disobedience of one man, Adam. And the obedience of the one starts to manifest in you, not by the power of your will or your willpower or your effort to try and bring it forth, but by the power of the resurrected Christ, just as what the disobedience of Adam brought you to a place where Paul said, the good that I don't want to, that I don't want to do, I do. In the very same way, we can now be at a place where we can say, the good that we want to do, we now can do. And maybe the evil that I've planned, I now cannot do it anymore because I have now become a slave of righteousness. Well, we will continue with this next week as we're going to look at Paul talking about this more in depth in chapter 2. So I trust that you have enjoyed this message and that you were deeply encouraged with this message. Thank you so much for all of you that have slotted in. You know, it's so good for me just to see your your names on the screen there and no, and for me to know that this impacts the lives of people. I ask you, by the mercies of the Lord, to take this message to heart and to say, Lord, thank you that you bring this forth in me. I'm available to this. This is what it's all about.
This is what you've come to bring forth in the earth, and I'm available for that. And as you do that, you will find that the Lord every day just bring more and more revelation to you as you have already experienced over the years that you've been listening to these messages and throwing yourself uh, and, 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 and just opening yourself up to the love of God that's in the presence of the throne of God's grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that I can just stretch forth my hands to everybody that is watching today. I thank you, Lord, that you have come to bring heaven to earth. And I thank you that the place where heaven and earth manifests its life is right here in us today. Thank you that we are not exempt from your life. Thank you, Lord, that what Adam, what the devil did in Adam cannot have any bearing on what you can do in us today. We stand under your throne of grace where you empower us with love and kindness and mercy, where we can see how we have been set free from death and how the power that can never end that is in the body of Jesus is now also in our bodies as we have become one flesh and one bone. We, we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And as we have been united with the body of Christ as the church, we are set free from the bondage of what happened in the earth, the death that entered in this earth through Adam, and we are under the rule of life and love. Thank you for that, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you heal sick people as they listen to this and as, as we pray now, that you stretch forth your hand towards them, that you provide supernaturally for people financially, and that you give them rest and peace in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much that I could have served you today, and then we will fellowship again next Sunday. God bless.